Joining me today on this uh, special episode of the Bandwagon Podcast is a, a specialist within um, public health. Um, he is uh, managing and leading the biggest public health treatment system in Europe. It's uh, Dr. Justin Varney. How are you? All right, Ricky. I'm doing good. Yeah, just to start off with, so like, can you just confirm that your background is not I- exactly where you live? <laughs> no, so I'm uh, I'm down visiting my parents for the weekend. So hence you've got the uh, fabulous Tatooine background. Uh, I think it is from Mandalorian. So that uh, is what the so difference. The, the comic scene is one of your kind of getaways, uh, mm-hmm. uh, your escapism. So like, um, I mean, it's fair to say you've probably had one of the busiest twelve months. Yeah, yeah, it's just been a little on the busy side. Um, it's kind of one of those things you um, you train for. Um, you do kind of uh, tabletop exercises, so you run like the fake scenarios, um, and you always think, "Oh, it might happen." Uh, I don't think anyone really thought it would, and certainly not in the way that the the COVID pandemic has has come. So it doesn't matter how much you train for something is a very different thing when it comes to reality. And, and this is probably, well, it is definitely the most serious uh, public health emergency in anyone's living memory who's alive now. So go, go, going back to kind of like um, pre-pandemic, um, there was a lot of talk at the time of um, uh, emergency kind of like um, protocols. I remember when mm-hmm. so the, the, the Wuhan situation was be, being um, um, reported on and one of your kind of your first things that you did within public health was to try and um, look at our contingency plans and mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, why did you have that inkling at that time because that was a you know that was a month or two before it, so the first cases came into the UK? Um, so I started getting briefings around uh, coronavirus 19 in December, I think was the first briefing I had from Public Health England uh, about what was going on. Uh, by January, we were seeing cases in Iran and Italy. And, and certainly my view at that point was we this was when it was going to come, not if. You know, uh, I think if it had just been in Iran, there is a chance we would have contained it. But the fact that it was in Italy and it was in a heavily tourist part of Italy. I mean, that's the other thing is, you know, this was a part of Northern Italy, which lots of people were off skiing at. It was that time of year, there were school trips. Um, So the potential for it to evolve was, was very clear. Um, I think also I probably come from that type of people that, that see the worst, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Um, You know, there is, you know this is where you do fall back on the old scouts and and brownies training of you know let prepare for it because if it doesn't happen yeah you might have wasted a few hours and and a bit of people's time Um, but if you don't do it and you haven't prepared it will be much much worse and I think you know uh, I was reflecting on this actually last week uh, with one of the politicians and said you know my I have tried to steer us through this pandemic as best as I can. And I've tried to be three or four steps ahead of the pandemic in terms of what are the worst case scenarios? Where was this virus going to go next? Um, to try and preempt that um, and to try and save as many people as we can. And it sounds awfully dramatic, but it is a bit like, you know, you're on the Titanic there's there's no way you can't you can avoid the iceberg but what you can do is get as many people into life rafts as fast as you can and and reduce the loss of life and the damage as as much as is possible and you know ultimately when you're facing this kind of global pandemic that's the best any of us can do is try and save as many people as we can one thing that i kind of like it it, it it still kind of strikes me is that the, 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 the discussion doesn't necessarily, um, it, no one's discussing of where it's kind of come from in terms of like the origins or how this situation has started. I was actually having this conversation with my wife who was like, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, what, what's this is to stop other viruses to come out? Because if we go back mm-hmm. in kind of history of viruses, people, virus t- tends to come in bunches. Would that be safe to say like, you know, there's, we're in a better position now or, are we still going to be continuing looking at other kind of potential viruses? So um, 
coronavirus 19 evolved um because viruses basically first of all viruses reproduce by using other animal cells so viruses very very simple organisms they don't have their own kind of kit to make baby viruses so what they do is they invite invade our cells or an animal cells and they use the factory bit of our cells to make new baby viruses and when you it's a bit like you know if you go to your mother-in-law's and bake a cake her oven is different from your oven so you can follow exactly the same recipe but you'll get a slightly different cake if you're using her oven rather than yours same thing when a virus is reproducing in a, in a human versus in say a pig or a fish uh, or a bird um it the the new baby viruses look slightly different and they make mistakes and and things change and that's the variations and most of the time that doesn't make any difference at all um, you know, it, it's a bit like, I suppose, changing the stitching on your jacket. It doesn't really make a huge amount of difference to the overall jacket, the look, nobody notices. But every now and again, one of those changes makes a big difference. Uh, and it either makes the virus more infectious, it makes it more deadly, um, or it makes it do different things that it wasn't doing before. And that's when you get a new strain of the virus. And that's what happened with coronavirus 19. Now, the reason viruses change much more than other organisms is that, one, they have to use um, other organisms, other creatures' cells to reproduce themselves. And also viruses do tend to jump between species. And that's very much what happened with coronavirus 19. It, um, we think is that it infected uh, humans first, then infected, I think it was bats, and then it went back to humans. Um, and we see that with flu every year. It's why you hear about pig flu, bird flu, you know, cow flu. It yeah. is because viruses do this. Um, and the environments in which this happens are what are called wet markets. So, um, you know, anyone who's been to a, a low income country, because they're very unusual in high income countries, low income countries and, and middle income countries, you often find markets where you can go and you can pick your animal and it's still alive and it's killed there and then and put it in a bag for you to take home. Mm. Now, the challenge with wet markets like that, those live markets, is you've got animals living very closely in compact spaces with humans. And that's where the virus can jump backwards and forwards. So more often than not, where we see this kind of virus mutation develop, it's usually tracked back to a wet market environment because they are like that. Or you find in some places it's where humans and animals live together. So in some cultures, you live above your animals, that kind of environment. But where animals and humans are very close to each other in enclosed settings with poor ventilation, that's where the viruses can jump back and forwards. And, and each time they do, they change a little bit. And sadly, lo and behold, we see coronavirus 19, we see avian flu. That's how these things evolve. So we will see more of these things, um, partially because we still have wet markets, partially because there are more humans now on the earth than there ever have been. So we're living much closer to each other. So that population density makes a difference as well. Um, and partially because when we do have these organisms appear, like coronavirus 19, you know, by the time we'd actually worked out it was here and it was behaving differently, people had been nipping all over the world. I mean, most of us had never heard of Wuhan before. No. You know, I didn't know, for example, that several of the universities in the city in Birmingham have campuses in Wuhan, it's a really big university part of China. So people are flying backwards and forwards the whole time. And so there's that added dimension that even when, you know, the first off something changing and, and mutating and evolving. Secondly, we travel all over the world the whole time. So it's ability to get from, you know, India to UK is basically a 13 hour flight. Whereas a hundred years ago, that would have taken four or five months. Now it takes a day. Mm. So the reality is that I think we will see, we will sadly see pandemics occur again. Um, Do you think in our like, like in our relatively short space lifetime, or, so, or what you mean that kind of long term? I think it's. I mean, I think 
Um, I think we're not out of the coronavirus one. I don't think we will be probably for about another year because of because it's going to take a long time to get a lot of the world vaccinated. And until most of the world is vaccinated, the, the virus can keep finding people to go and play and change in and evolve and create new variants. And each time it does, there's a risk one of them will beat the vaccine. Um, flu every year changes. So we're always one step away from flu pandemic where we get a flu virus that that does what coronavirus has done, becomes much more infectious and puts more people in hospital. I mean, flu every year, about a thousand people die in the UK um, from flu. Um, but that's because generally the mutations we have with flu haven't been too bad. If we get one with flu that that say doubles the death rate or trebles the death rate, and is more infectious, more people catch it, then you, you're looking at a similar kind of scenario we have with coronavirus. Mm. So it's, I think we will see more of these. Uh, I also think because we globally, we travel way more than we ever have in history and more of us do it and we do it in and population density is increasing, all of those things. I think, yeah, we probably will see another one. I'd quite like it to wait another 20 odd years so I can retire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I have a horrible suspicion um, we will see this, this kind of thing becoming more common. Um, and then the question mark is, what does that really mean for us in society? And, and how do we change? Because we can't spend our lives going in and out of lockdown. Mm. Yeah, it's so, a very, very blunt tool. I mean, I just want to kind of go um, take a little bit of an angle here on some of the kind of conspiracies as well from it. So I don't know how much you would kind of entertain some of these conspiracies. Well, I, I do know. Uh, I'm just trying to play dumb. Um, with, with, with Wuhan, it, it, it did say that, it, um, you know, there are strong reports that they, they do have one of these uh, facilities there, which mm -hmm. does have like coronavirus. Do you, do you feel that that was one of the things that happened, that there was a leak from, from there and it mixed with the wet market? I think it's unlikely, uh, partially because uh, scientific labs are super tight. I mean, you know, every country, every major country in the world in terms of major economy has a lab which deals with extremely high risk viruses uh, and, and pathogens. We have one in, in England. It's down in, in near Salisbury, a place called Porton Down. Uh, I went there when I was working from, for Public Health England. It's a very strange place. It's, <laughs> it's a military compound kind of space. And, you know, the labs are underground and it's, it, you know, it is, it is an unusual environment. Um, so, you know, the, these things, and because these labs are doing research primarily focused on how to prevent these kind of pandemics, but in order to do that, you've got to have some of the virus. So, you know, is it possible that occasionally an animal from one of these labs escapes? Yes, perfectly plausible. Um, do I think it's a malicious attempt by the Chinese government to attack the rest of the world? No, because they lost, you know, hundreds, <laughs> tens of thousands of people in China and it massively impacted their economy. It, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's not even just shoot yourself in the foot. It's like chop off two arms and, and your legs and you still keep going. So it's not a sensible strategy. Um, I also kind of get to a point where you go, well, what's the point? I mean, whether whether it did link back to a lab, whether it was purely natural evolution, does it make a difference to the pandemic we're facing now? Does it make a difference to how many people end up in hospital? How many people have died of this pandemic? No, it just means you get to point the finger in a slightly different direction. And instead of pointing at animals, um, and a wet market, you're pointing it at the lab because you believe that's the, the kind of the way the world works. If that makes you happy, I don't care, frankly. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people who, unfortunately, this plays into their view of the world and their, their, their kind of um, belief system. And you can either spend a lot of energy trying to go, that's wrong and uh, X, Y, and Z, or you just go, well, if that's what you believe, I'll respect that you have that belief. What I really want to focus on is how to stop you dying and how to stop you catching the virus and giving it to someone and killing them, because that's what's important. Whether you believe it came from space aliens, scientific labs, spy thrillers, uh, monkeys, bats or fish, it don't know, make no difference. It's here. Yeah, yeah. And what we've got to do is stop it killing people. 
I think we, I think as the as we go kind of longer in this uh, in this world, I mean, we we do know well the, the lockdown end is in sight, and I'll come to that in the future. I think there was this kind of build up of narrative. I think at the beginning of the the, in the through the whole pandemic. You know, people were looking for leaders. People were looking for kind of like, how, you know, what what is this about? There was a lot of fear around. Do you feel that there's this kind of distrust that these conspiracy theories kind of manifest? And and just to kind of follow up on that, how was it dealing with you know the, the first days of when this was starting to really take a hold within within Birmingham or in the UK nationally? Yeah, well, I think you know, I, I think we've got to acknowledge it was a really scary time i mean you this hasn't happened before i mean you and and when we were looking at the numbers i mean i was being given predictions from uh department of health which was predicting nine thousand deaths in birmingham now the average for the last five years is nowhere near that I mean, you know, it, 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 there's 9,000 additional deaths from COVID on top of what we would normally have. Um, it's, I mean, that, that's a point where you have to kind of start thinking through, well, are we going to use tree diggers to bury bodies vertically because we're going to run out of burial plots within weeks? Um, you know, we can't run the crematorium any faster than it's running because the, the thing basically explodes. I mean, there's a limit to how long you can run it. You have to let it cool down. So there are all of these kind of mass fatality plans that we have to think through, all of those things. So, you know, back in March last year, we were facing something which was completely overwhelming the Italian health system, the pictures from Italy, the, the first-hand narratives from healthcare professionals were there. So that definitely played into conspiracy theories um, and you know, people who, who that was their worldview. Um, but as I, said, I mean, you know, my focus was very much, okay, what do I need to do today? What do I need to do tomorrow? And is there anything I need to do next week that in order to get there, I've got to set things in train? How much can I stabilize my staff um, and support them so that they navigate the fear um, and keep on on track? Um, what do I need to do with the politicians and to work with them to support them? How do I make sure, you know, have we agreed who's fronting what? Key messages, key steps, you know, and there are certainly things I look back now and I go, damn, I wish I had made a different decision. Mm. Um, hand sanitizer is the one that I, you know, I look, but it sounds stupid. It, I look back at it and, it, you know, do you say kind of what do you regret? What did you not do? I remember having a conversation with head of facilities who was going, well, the price of hand sanitizer has gone up by like a pound a bottle. Well, you know, sh should we buy some? And I was going, well, you know, we, we really want the hand sanitizer to go to the NHS. You know, I don't think we should be stockpiling it for, for council buildings. Um, and I waited three days and then I just went, buy, 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 buy whatever you can. Um, and, and by that time, the stock, it was already getting difficult. And we ended up having to work with uh, the University of Birmingham to, and, and the other university cities. We went on a raiding party and every bit of hydrogen peroxide we could find in every lab in the city. And the university set up a field lab using the World Health Organization's field hand sanitizer recipe. Yep. And they produced it in Gallen, but you'll remember this. We went and we went, <laughs> you know, I went with staff down to Muji in New Street with shopping bags, uh, because we couldn't get plastic bottles. And I we bought every plastic container they had and we bottled the hand sanitizer that the university made for us. And that went out to social workers uh, and to bin men and frontline staff mm -hmm. because it, there was nothing else. Um, so at the time, um, at the time, I think I went back to my doctor training, you know, and viewed it a bit like running a trauma call. You know, sometimes you, you, when you're working in the emergency room, it is like Grey's Anatomy. You know, I mean, there's lots of things in Grey's Anatomy that are rubbish or, <laughs> or casualty, but you know, there is a bit where you walk in and you, as a doctor, your job is to keep everyone calm and do whatever you can to get the person on the table 
to live through the next couple of hours so you can get them into wherever they need to be. Um, or if that's not going to happen, to do what you need to do to give them dignity and peace so that they, their last uh, days or last hours or minutes are, are as peaceful as you can make it. And that's the mode I flipped into. Mm. You know, what, what can I do? What can, how can I anchor my team, the wider council, the wider partnership, give them confidence and stability that, yeah, this is a really scary time. There are lots of things we don't know, but let's focus on what we do and what we can do. Go back to the basics. And our job is to get the city through and as many people through this as safely as we can. Um, yeah. And which sounds awfully melodramatic, but, you know, it, it, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Yeah, I remember when um, you know reading something in the in the in the in the paper where they were talking about there's there's been more deaths from COVID than the world wars, mm. and I was like, I, I think for me that the, the statistic kind of you know that kind of hit hit through because I remember um, I was we we were kind of I was like a, a kind of functioning place really within community mm. to try and push out some of these messages and. You know, it was the, the negative news and those conspiracy theories is, you know, like the 5G ones or there mm -hmm. was ambulance workers pretended to be ambulance mm -hmm. workers or people getting those euthanasia been happening in, in, in hospitals and trying to correct that. Um, it was almost like a personal cr crusade that to go through. Did you did you have the same feeling as well at that time? I know you just said like you had to anchor the people around you, but how are you anchoring yourself in terms of, like you said, you flipped into it, but then also mm. having that responsibility for the city? Um, I think to some extent, I don't think I anchored myself necessarily consciously until we were through the first wave. So the first wave I went into doctor mode. I mentally put on my white coat mm. and I was, I mean, you, you know, and, and obviously this will know we work together. So, you know, I worked seven days a week, 10, 10 to 14 hours a day, uh, pretty much from March to July. Um, and it helps i type phenomenally fast <laughs> and like yeah i just verified this guy <laughs> is i don't know anyone who works as crazy <laughs> i think that's the only way because we were convinced mm. there was like three of you because it was like mm. two o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning e emails mm -hmm. um, and i didn't really think it helped when we had the government briefings at like 5 p.m in the evening and oh yeah we were getting the phone calls at 9 a.m saying mm. yeah what, what do we do now because we mm. we had no idea at that point as well yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, and, and to be fair to colleagues in government, and I, I'd spent, before I came to Birmingham, I'd spent six years working in public health England nationally. So I've got some inkling of what it's like to be a, a national civil servant. And, you know, I mean, those guys work their socks off, um, you know, and I know the uh, last 24 hours, uh, Public Health England took a bit of a beating. Uh, about the data report being released at, I think it was nine o'clock on Friday evening. Um, in order to get those documents out, they have to go through kind of seven checks of are they accurate, there are no typos, then they have to go through senior officials and then ministers have to see them before they go out. So all of that has to happen. Uh, and it's the most up-to-date data. So it's not easy to do. But we were often, we would find out about things, I would find out about things the same re the same time the rest of the country did in the five o'clock briefings. And then suddenly it's, oh, okay, right, what does that mean for what we've got to do tomorrow? Um, I think the fake news stuff, I mean, eh, there was some really nasty stuff going on. There still is. I mean, you know, the... the um, the stuff that was flagged up and we locally found evidence of um manipulation of google to try and um misdirect people from testing sites so we we were fortunate we have a, a series of trainees that come from from uh, military forces um i would never have noticed it 
um, because yeah. one of our trainees happened to have the the right training, he picked up why was it that people were who were being sent to a testing site were kept being sent by Google to the wrong address, like literally like five or six streets away. Mm. Um, and the problem with that, which you might kind of go, well, that's not a big headache, aside from really annoying the lady whose house it was that, that people kept knocking on the door going, aren't you the testing centre? And she's like, no, I'm not, leave me alone. Yeah. Um, actually, people don't bother to then go to the right place. So it's a really subtle but quite nasty thing to do. And what was driving it was this series of um, basically malware and, and, and spy bot type things. And this is where it all gets very MO, MI5 um, that were manipulating the Google algorithms to, to, um, to basically prevent the right address coming up in the search and instead put the wrong one in. Um, there was an awful, awful, awful whatsapp one where a woman was pretending to be a member of ambulance staff um very very convincing to someone i think um i mean it could have been a casualty script mm. when i listened to it i know it's not right and there were kind of three or four things that were just factually both they were factually wrong but also clinically they were wrong so i was I, you know once i listened to it i was like this is definitely not an nh mem nhs member of staff because there are four or five things that are just so wrong that yeah. even the most basic member of staff would know this so i recorded a clip to say you know this is my name this is my title this i've heard this clip this is why it cannot be true this is why this person is not someone who works for the nhs and we put that out and you helped get it out as did others through whatsapp to try and counter it um but very quickly it got to a point where we can't do that for every bit of fake news there's too much of it um but some of the really horrendous ones we did we did take action on um and i hope in a little way that helped um but it's this whole year has i think opened everyone's eyes to how manipulative fake news is um we know that some of the stuff about vaccines and fertility is coming from far-right extremists specifically targeted at non-white ethnic groups to scare them into not having the vaccine so they'll die and you know it, it, which is just yeah. you go what and it's like yeah actually there's and it, coming from america where they they uncovered this there are some very specific ones that are very clever i mean the advertising is very smart um but it's specifically targeted to prey on the insecurities, the trust issues, particularly of the, the Black, African and Caribbean community in America. Um, but behind it, the group that have done it are not doing it because they're worried about vaccine and fertility, because there is no evidence of link yeah. there. They're doing it because they know this will stop these people getting the vaccine That's and it. therefore they will die. And therefore this group of people will rub their hands with glee, which is horrendous. Yeah. But if you see the ad, you won't see that. What you'll see is something that's quite convincing and pseudo medical and you can get sucked in by it. So I think, you know, it's it certainly, it, it, I mean, it's just, I suppose what it's done is it, it has uh, shaken a little bit my belief in in most of us are good and and tread this earth to make it a better place. And, and what you have seen is that some of us are definitely not. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think that, after a short while, the the whole COVID situation went from being kind of a healthcare issue into kind of more of a a political basketball game as well. With you know with casualties just happening, you know all, all around. Um, f fairly early on, I think it, the, the data started to come out that there was you know people from different ethnicities and non-white ethnicities were kind of being becoming more susceptible to this. What was the reaction to that, and what was kind of some of the first steps that? that um that we, that was taken yeah i mean it was interesting at the time because so first of all it's important to kind of say the reason this wasn't obvious in day one is for two reasons so one on your death certificate it doesn't record your ethnicity so was it is there a particular reason for that because to me that sounds a bit of a basic thing 
Yeah, well, there's lots of things that you look at and go, the world. <laughs> you know, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be straightforward if we could get, you know, all the NHS had one IT system and they all talk to each other really simply so that when you change GPs, it doesn't take 16 weeks for your prescription instructions. Yeah. No, I get yeah. your point. Okay. There, there are loads of things like that. <laughs> um, I think, though, in this one, um, I think, bluntly, I think it's because no one ever thought it would matter. So um, the NHS, probably for about hmm, 30 years, has been trying to improve ethnic monitoring in patient data, so in hosp particularly hospital data. And they threw money at it. They basically put bribes in. So if you were a hospital and you got 90% or above of your data was coded properly with people's ethnicity, you got an extra boost of money. Still didn't work, but it still really struggled to get that coverage. So, um, And then for death certificates, it was just never asked. So when we were in the early days, what we were hearing from communities was more people are dying from our community than from the white community. So we had a lot of anecdote, but not a lot of fact. Um, and, you know, we tried to work with funeral directors, but they were completely overwhelmed. They just couldn't fill in bits of paper. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't they didn't want to, but, you know, they would just, they just did not have any bandwidth to be able to do it. Um, so in Birmingham, I mean, we brought together the Health and Wellbeing Board. We did an emergency session of the board. A public session in April to talk about the inequalities from what communities were telling us um, and um, we live streamed it we crashed the system the yeah. council IT system couldn't cope no one had ever listened in I mean at one point we had over 400 people listening in live to a council meeting now I don't think it's ever happened yeah in the history of the council no. so um so the it just didn't cope um but even having recorded it, it was still downloaded and we talked at that meeting about what what is it we knew for fact what did the numbers tell us um and um two of our largest hospitals had audited their data so they they could talk about what was happening as inpatients and that was showing some differences what were communities telling us? And then, okay, so what would we, what do we need to do differently? There's no evidence, there's still no evidence that says that um, people from different ethnic cultures, um, this disease behaves differently in them. So there isn't a kind of genetic difference as far as we can tell in terms of COVID. What there is evidence, very good evidence now, and it emerged over the summer that your health went before you catch COVID makes a big difference on how you, you whether you survive COVID or not. Mm. So the biggest risk factor is how old you are. The older you are, the, mu the more likely you are to die if you catch COVID. Um, if you're a man, you're more likely to die than if you're a woman. Um, if you're obese or overweight, you're more likely to die. If you're a smoker, if you have a long-term condition like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and if that condition is badly controlled, so your blood sugars, if you're diabetic, your blood yeah. sugars are all over the place. Um, and then the final risk factor is if you're from a non-white British ethnic group. But what they really, what, what more and more we found as we've gone through the last year is the more you analyze the data, the more you go, well, actually the ethnicity difference is a result of, of the other factors, particularly the, the long-term conditions factor. And we, we've known for decades, and, and this is the, you know, the sad thing is it's taken a pandemic for the rest of the world to understand what public health has been trying to get people to pay attention to. Yeah. If you are not white British, you are more likely to have some of these conditions um, because of lifestyle factors, deprivation, um, some of it is genetic, things like diabetes, type 2 diabetes in South Asian populations. Um, there is a genetic component to that. Um, but it's not just you more likely to have the disease. You're much less likely to get a decent level of care. So all, there was an audit, I think, four or five years ago of diabetes care nationally. And it really clearly shows people who are white got all nine of the recommended boxes ticked. People who were from other ethnic communities did not, mm. um, you know, and it was a difference of kind of 40 to 50% in terms of 
the difference between different groups and the white British group. So as we came into the pandemic, these communities were facing additional challenges. The other things that, that you know, we didn't talk about as much in the beginning, which we do now is, you know, more people um, from our ethnic communities work in jobs that weren't, you couldn't do from home. So taxi driver, bus driver, care assistant, nurse, doctor, um, you know, security guard, all of those jobs carried on working during the pandemic. They, even in lockdown, they were still out doing their jobs and therefore they were exposed and they were exposed both because of the job they were doing, but also getting to and from work, public transport, for example, particularly in London was a very, very big transmission risk. Um, so, you, and then the third element of this is also household composition that the more people in your house, basically once COVID's in the house, unless you're really, really good and you've been using um, some of the things like germdefense.org to, to kind of look at your house and learn what you could do differently. Once it's in the house, it spreads through the house. So if there are seven people in your house, seven people get it. Whereas if you're you know, only two people in your house and, and, that, and there are you know, many of our South Asian families uh, and actually many of our African and Caribbean families uh, have kind of two, three generations living in the house together, sometimes four, um, so they were also vulnerable because they, they had larger households. And once it was in, it just ripped yeah. through as well. I think we, uh, you know, from, from within uh, kind of my community, some of the stories were actually being more, um, actually did, did a lot of the kind of messaging from, you know, supporting the government messages where you, you would know, you know, a whole household being, it's gone through them. And unfortunately there's been deaths. You, you were hearing some horrific stories of what, you know, people losing their parents within days and, it, you know, and there was a real sense of scare, scare um, you know, of fear of general fear, you know, that heightened fear of like, you know, that we we kind of bumped in, especially once we watched everyone watch Tiger King, we just knew, okay, hang on, what, <laughs> what, what, what's going to be next? I kind of, I kind of had that as a, as a marker in, 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 in history in terms of, you know, where it was going to be. So just, just kind of moving it forward then, Justin, mm -hmm. we've got, we're in the situation now, we're a couple of weeks away from, you know, June the 21st and, and this, this new variant that's coming in now from, from India what what do we know about it and uh, at this point and and uh, what do you think you know the the next couple of weeks are going to look like yeah so the april variant is, which is what we're now calling it i mean one of the challenges is we um we're really good at naming things after where they first appeared so it took a long time to get from the wuhan virus to then covid-19 and then the kent variant is still in the uk called the kent variant the rest of the world calls it the uk variant um, but we recognise, and we particularly saw this in the first wave, that that does lead to hate crime. It, it, it leads, leads to racial discrimination. So um, the April variant, which is what I would now call it, rather than the Indian variant. Um, right, okay. So that's what we're talking about. So the April variant, um, we know, is more infectious than the Kent variant. Um, we know that the April variant is... Um, as likely to put you in hospital as the Kent variant. And we know that the vaccines work if you've had two doses. If you've had one dose, they still work in terms of stopping you dying, but they, they're less good at stopping you end up in hospital. Right. Which is why right. the government's pulled forward your second dose. So if you already had one dose, rather than wait 12 weeks, you're getting it eight weeks. Right. The reason it's eight weeks is because the, the research showed quite well, actually, that it's better to have a longer period between the two jabs rather than have them quickly one after another. You get a better defense if you leave it a bit longer. Right. So in that scenario, we've got something which is um, at least as deadly yeah. as the previous one, more infectious, and they, that means we will have more people that catch it and therefore more people will end up in hospital and potentially more people will die than if we'd have just stuck with the Kent version. Now, the buffer to that is the vaccine. That's the one, one really good defence because the only other option is we go back into full lockdown and I don't think any of us 
really can cope with with another year of that. So the the biggest buffer for this is to get anyone who is eligible get a vaccine in their arm as fast as possible. And what you're starting to see is that the government is really ramping up. You know, we're pretty much dropping a year in the age cohort a day. Yeah. I, mean, I think over the last week we've gone from it was like 38 year olds and above on Monday, and by Friday we're down to 30, 32 or 33 year olds. Nearly my, you know, 20. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's love, it, everyone's getting in there, and and I think you know that is our best defence because we will get a third wave, whether it's yeah. driven by the April variant or there's another one that comes out. There will be a third wave, and the people who are going to die in the third wave are the people who haven't been vaccinated. And it's as simple as that. I mean, you, the reality is, if you have not been vaccinated, when the third wave comes, the virus will find you. And you are, you are going to end up in hospital and you are going to die, potentially. And that's why having the vaccine is so important. You know, and we've now got millions and millions of people who had the vaccine safely, yeah. Yes, there is a small number of very, very rare side effects, but that's no different from any other vaccine. You know, all, all medicines have side effects uh, and the frequency of the side effects with the um, COVID vaccines are not are actually much rarer than the side effects with things like the contraceptive pills. So, mm. you know, put it, read the science, ask the questions. If you've got questions, that's what you know, the NHS is, is about at the moment is answering the questions, but please get the vaccine um, because the third wave will come and those that are unvaccinated are most likely to die. So particularly in the older age groups. Do, and, do, and, do you feel the, th- the, the third wave will go towards like win- towards winter? Well, I think there are two, two schools of thought on this. Um, so first school of thought is we all come out of lockdown um, we kind of give up on the rules a bit too quickly. So particularly the testing, I mean, this is the one that I kind of feel is really like missing at the moment, getting into people's heads. You know, it, Yes, we can go and visit friends and family, but you make it safer by doing a rapid lateral flow test before you do it. You know, Just by sticking that swab up your nose and waiting 30 minutes, you reduce your risk of being someone who's there without symptoms and is highly infectious. So if we all did that, twice a week we you know we would probably push back a third wave until the autumn if people don't do that people stop testing and they all go out and we all go to the cinema theater go out watch 50 matches whatever it is um then we will see a rapid increase in case rates and potentially we'll see a third wave hit us by july um, and then the big question is, does that third wave put people in hospital? It will put some. I mean, that's the, the reality is that. But does it put so many in that the NHS is facing threat again and then we go back into lockdown? Or does the government say, actually, it's still killing people and it's still putting people in hospital, but it's a tolerable level. It's like flu that we can cope with that and it's OK. Um, and at a national level, you kind of go, I can live with that. But at a personal level, those are still people dying. Those are still people ending up in hospital. So, you know, I, I think for everyone who is not vaccinated yet, who's eligible, you've got to kind of weigh up for yourself. Do I want to be confident that I, I can weather the storm or do I want to be vulnerable or not? And, you know, you, you have to make those personal decisions, but the government will do it at a national level but that doesn't mean nobody's going to die. It just means that the number of people dying we can cope with. We're not going to have to open extra mortuaries. There aren't kind of body bags in the car park. Um, so I, that doesn't mean no one's going to die. And I think that's the challenge at the moment is because government's weighing up kind of how much the NHS can hope, cope with versus, um, you know, keeping the numbers of people dying and the numbers of people in hospital manageable. Um, it doesn't mean there's no one dying. And, and it's a difficult message for the public to, to get across to the public is just because we're managing it doesn't mean people aren't dying. doesn't mean you can't die if you haven't got the vaccine. It just, it just feels, it feels weird. Like, you know, there's still some restrictions and, and, and how it is, but you got June the 21st and, you know, everything's like, you know, 
everyone run topless and do what the hell you like. And it just feels that is there is there something in the middle that just kind of you know another stage before that and before that end period because you you are seeing you know concerts arranged you are seeing all these mm. things happening um and do you think personally there might be uh you know some additional uh, restrictions after the 21st so just just double check did you just say everyone goes topless in june because no. i don't think the english weather's quite up to that for a start uh, um but no. I think what you meant was mar- <laughs> I think what you meant was maskless, um, no, which is a yeah. slightly different thing. No, but if well, to be fair, <laughs> if you actually drove around uh, in Birmingham on Saturday, um, just in go. the thirty minutes of sun that we had, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I'm just saying, you know, you've got the drunken rowdiness, yeah, yeah, and people yeah, still yeah. still behaving in that yeah. way. You know, people inhibitions are gone. I I think you know there is this real challenge of that we've had a horrible year. Uh, and suddenly you're allowed to go hug your granny again and everyone wants to go do it. Um, I think, you know, the government has always said that they would be driven by the data and, you know, the June relaxation, they've, they've been very vague. And I think actually that's quite on purpose at the moment. I think, you know, the current picture is, would you, you know, would, would do we give up everything in June? I think it probably unlikely. I think what we're more likely to see is, June being about um, some things coming back and some things coming back perhaps with some additional rules. So we've seen the pilots of, for example, uh, mass spectator sport. But everyone going to those matches had to test two days before uh, with a lateral flow test. You know, the, the, the group that were going clubbing, they tested, I think it was three days before, the day before, and the day of the, the, the club as well. So you were filtering out people. Um, so we may see more of that, that actually um, we can have these freedoms, but they come with that responsibility to test. And I think that's the, the key bit is it's not, it's not free for all. Um, I think the one that is gonna be really tricksy is some holidays, it's going abroad. Um, you know, the, the, the case rates in other countries um, and the question is not just are their case rates shooting up, it's are the case rates shooting up with a variant that we haven't seen before. So a lot of what's happening in Europe is being driven by the Kent variant that caused our massive case rates to rise in December and January. So we're kind of relatively chilled because it's already here, it's yeah. the majority. The April variant, the Indian uh, that originated in India and Pakistan, um, is here is slowly starting to take over from the Kent variant. Um, so once we get to a position, if we do, where that is the majority of what we've got, we may be much more relaxed about people going backs and forwards in, in, to countries where there's lots of that. Um, but if you take something like the Brazil variant, I mean, in Burma, we've only had one case of the Brazil variant in the last, I think, four months. It's really rare in the UK, the Brazil variant, partially because there's not a huge amount of travel between the UK and Brazil. Um, but so I, I think, you know, and the, and the gamble that for people going on holiday is you go on holiday and it's a green country when you arrive, it turns amber while you're away and therefore you've got a quarantine. And the worst case scenario is you're on a plane coming back and it turns red and suddenly you're whacked with a thousand pound plus bill for a quarantine hotel. So you know, I think I, I think this summer it's a little bit of um, domestic holidays first, and then if you are if you do want to travel, certainly put off your honeymoons, your world cruises, twenty twenty two. Yeah, and this year is not the year to, to go around the world. I think so if, if I want to if I want to plan my fortieth, so I will be taking donations if anybody who's <laughs> wanted to like next year. Would you reckon that'll be safe? Yeah, I think by next year. Um, oh yeah. I think we're probably going to be in a world in which there are some parts of the world which are, will still be avoidable or we would be advised to avoid because they will be poorly vaccinated and therefore the likelihood of new variants appearing in, in poorly vaccinated countries is much, much higher. Um, and that depends a lot on COVAX, which is the global effort in which we donate vaccines to countries that are low middle income to support their effort. It also depends a lot on what is happening in India at the moment. And we keep in mind India and China 
are two of two largest manufacturers of vaccine in the world. So we are very, very dependent globally on oh, them to course. produce vaccine. And I mean, you, Europe and the UK are in a better position than many other countries because um, we do um, we do manufacture bits of the vaccine and, and we're also very good at designing the vaccine uh, as the Oxford AstraZeneca one showed. Um, there's the new Novavax one and they built basically from scratch a brand new vaccine manufacturing plant. Uh, I forget where it is, somewhere in the north of England. And um, to give us some resilience, to give us some ability to produce our own, um, because you know, the rapid escalation in India meant that five million doses of, of vaccine we were expecting to come, that quite rightly the government has said, no, they need to stay in India and be used in India because you know, the faster we can vaccinate the Indian population, the safer the rest of the world is. Um, and that's true for any country that is, um, you know, rapidly developing because until the world is vaccinated, this disease has the ability to mutate again and again and again and again. And each time it does, there's a risk that it will do something that breaks through the vaccine and, and therefore we will go back to square one. So it's, you know, it, it's going to be a challenging year, but I think for next year, you probably are okay to start planning um, your uh, your adventures down in uh, Ibiza or Magali for wherever it is your, your fancy game. Um, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to That's celebrate. cool. Cool. Um, I just want to go, like, you know, last couple of questions on, on, on around sort of COVID was children have been, you know, uh, been very fortunate in, in in general not to suffer too greatly from from this at this point. What is the risk in terms of like for for children going forward? In terms of will they will they get, will they have a vaccination program? Do you feel? Um, so the there have been trials going on to test whether the vaccine is safe in children, um, and they were completed quite a long time ago actually. Um, and then the next take of the trials was looking at. Uh, how does the vaccine work in children? So children's immune systems um, work slightly different from adults in the, uh, you know, as you know, things like the measles and mumps vaccine, we need to give three doses because kids' immune systems, they're, they're, because as the child grows, they're kind of developing and evolving. Um, so what they've been doing in the trials is looking at whether two doses is enough with children or whether the children would need a three-dose schedule. Um, what it looks like is for children over 12, uh, two doses is enough. Um, and there are plans from the government to roll out vaccination to the over 12s in the early autumn to coincide with kids coming back to school. Now, at the moment, we're really lucky that this virus and its variants in general does not seem to make children very sick and certainly doesn't put large numbers in hospital in the UK, and I repeat, in the UK. The challenge we have with the April variant is that in India and Pakistan we and Bangladesh, we have seen quite large numbers of children being taken to hospital with COVID. And similarly in the Brazil variant, Brazil and in Chile, we've seen large numbers of children admitted to hospital. Now, the problem is that the baseline health, the, the health of those children last year compared to the health of children in the UK are completely different. So it's very difficult to know, is this because the virus has changed, so it is making children sick now, um, or is it simply that in those countries, the children's health was so much worse to begin with that COVID just pushes them over the edge? Um, and the evidence at the moment we're seeing from areas like Bolton, which have got large amounts of the April uh, variant, suggests that um, it's not um, putting more children in hospital. It's certainly infecting children. Yeah. Um, and like the Kent variant did at Christmas, we saw lots more children catch it and going off school and that brought it into the household and everything else. Um, but what we're also seeing in areas like Bolton is that vaccination works. So, where at Christmas, Kent variant came home with the kids from school and everyone in the house got it. This time, April variant comes home. And if granny and granddad live with you, they're not catching it because they've been vaccinated. 
So the vaccine's acting as a confined firebreak. And if mum and dad have been vaccinated, then actually the virus doesn't go anywhere. It's stuck in that child and it's stuck in that house. And the household isolates, but it hasn't got anywhere else to go. So, it, you know, it, it really is, vaccines are acting as a firebreak around children. I think it less likely we'll go and vaccinate younger children, um, partially because in younger children, you do have to give multiple doses for vaccines to work, really. Um, and unless there's evidence that the virus is starting to make younger children very sick and put them in hospital, there's no point putting them through something if they don't need it. Um, but we keep that under review. And, and I think, you know, this again is, I mean, I was really struck. I was talking to some young people um, from my youth COVID champions last week and, um, they're really scared um, and they're really angry and they're really angry at adults that aren't following the rules because they understand why they're not being vaccinated. They weren't actually making the point. You know, it was really interesting because they were saying, we know we're kind of bottom of the queue to get the vaccine and we get that because our risk of dying is so much less. doesn't mean we can't die. It's just very, very unlikely. But what really annoys us is we see all these, you know, drunk adults out out on the town falling all over each other no masks no social distancing we see people get on the bus and not wear, wear their masks and that makes us really annoyed because they're adults they're grown-ups they should be responsible and they should be responsible for protecting us and playing their part and i thought that was such a powerful um you know powerful way to put it actually because they are going to be the last group of people who get the vaccine. So everything that we do as adults, we need to keep in mind we're doing it to protect them. We're doing it to protect the elderly, but we're also doing it to protect them. Mm. Um, and I hope that parents particularly get that message a little bit more because it, you know, this is about protecting the people you love. Mm. So one of the things that is definitely going to come out of, um, out of this kind of this time um, is, is there's gonna there's people with a lot of trauma psych like there's like mm. a little bit of mental health there's long covid and you know there's people several people that even um that i know and that you've that you mm. can even see the following how do you think society is going to um face up to that challenge um to kind of make some of these uh, adaptations in the future um it's interesting. So we we spent some time over the last week looking at how do we let's uh, let's stop talking about the legacy of COVID and let's start talking about what we're going to do that really is going to address some of the the issues. Um, you know, over three thousand people have died from COVID in Birmingham in the last year. Um, that's three thousand families who need bereavement counselling. Um, you that's nowhere near that what we would have in a normal year i mean that's like double the amount so um so we're looking at can we boost that can we train up more volunteers but you can't do that overnight i mean it was one of the the really wise decisions colleagues in the nhs made back in april last year where we put more money into cruise which is the bereavement counseling service to expand their services and then it still wasn't enough um but what we're also doing is looking at things like, can we train up bereavement volunteers to go into schools to talk about bereavement? Because, you know, it's one of the things that in pre-COVID times I was very much an advocate for um, is talking about death and dying. We don't do it enough as a society. It's kind of in that to do taboo space yeah. like cancer. Um, and that's not good for our mental health. So there's areas like that. I think the um, the long COVID or the COVID syndrome, post-COVID syndrome, we've now got clinics uh, people can be referred into. It's a lot of rehab. Um, you, uh, It's not an easy condition. It's quite a nasty condition. And we're seeing it in, um, it's not something that you're more likely to get if you're older, actually all age groups. You are more likely to get... Um, it if you were hospitalized but actually we're still seeing it in people that weren't hospitalized and people had virtually no symptoms still developing a post-covid syndrome 
Um, and that's going to have implications for employment law and it probably will end up classified, I expect, as a disability because of the level of severity. It's, it can be very, very nasty. Um, we've obviously got the economic shock and then all of the bits that play out of that, the restaurants that are, sh- are closed. You know, I'm gutted some of my favourite restaurants in Birmingham mm. um, have sadly just not made it through. Um, and those are jobs that people now are on universal credit and you know i as an officer i can't get political but it is you know it, it is hard to live on universal credit yeah. um so i think there are all sorts of angles of this where the ripple of covid will be long i think birmingham has weathered this storm better than anyone predicted and that that is down to the citizens of birmingham it's down to the community organisations that mobilised around our food banks. It's down to the fire service and the police who went and knocked on doors and checked people were okay. It's down to our binmen, our social workers, the council, the politicians. I mean, I've never worked in an environment in which politicians from completely different ends of the political spectrum, when this is more important than politics, and actually just got on with what, what you know, sat around the table and said, what is it you need us to do? And then they went and did it. Mm. And, you know, that that's what got us through. And we've still lost lots of lives, but it could have been so, so much worse. And that's the spirit of Birmingham that will get us through the next decade of recovery. And we've got great things like the Commonwealth Games coming, all sorts of stuff that will just help boost us as a city and keep us moving forward and keep giving people opportunities to regain hope and light in their lives and that is whether you're spiritual or not coming through this year all of us have struggled and had moments in which the light has been that dimmer or gone out and that's the key bit of this next phase is bringing that hope and light back into people's lives so that they can look to a better future and work to get there and see it's worth working for. Um, but it's that's a really hard, it, you know, that is one of the hardest things in the public sector to do is inspire hope and, and not come across like a, a kind of cheesy TV advert. Yes. Um, but it is at the heart of what we need to do for recovery. So, you know, COVID has obviously dominated the, uh, the public health sphere. And, you, you know, you've you've talked about how, a little bit earlier about how the general public didn't necessarily know the 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 the, 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 the responsibility of public health. What else is what else should people still be aware of non COVID wise on a, on a public health agenda? <laughs> That's like a whole other podcast. You're going to have to have me back for that one. Um, yeah, I mean, the. the I mean, ultimately, when you look at how we've come through COVID, um, there are lots and lots of people who died who might not have died. I can't say they definitely wouldn't have died, but might not have died if their baseline health was better, if they were active every day, if they weren't smoking, if their weight was a better weight, if they had a better relationship with the NHS and they actually weren't you felt more engaged and more in control of their health. I mean, one of the things that really shocked me um, when we started to talk about vaccine with communities is actually how low people's, what I call health literacy, their basic understanding of their bodies and their and how medicines work is. Um, uh, and I continue have to remind myself, you know, I, I did spend <laughs> six years at medical school. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of things I kind of go, oh, yeah, of course, that's how it is. And then I forget that actually most people didn't go to medical school. So, you know, I think there's a there's a lot of that. Um, you know, we in the city, we have been in the five worst areas of the country for infant mortality for the number of children who die before their first birthday in Birmingham is I think currently we're third worst in the country that's not okay that's hundred it's over 100 babies who die before their first birthday every year in this city and it's been like that for 30 years and that's not okay so there are things where we've got to unpack some of this and you know and it can't be done overnight we've got to create a city in which people can 
live healthy lives, but not because we strap them all to treadmills and ram celery sticks down their throats, mm. but because we fight, create a city in which all of us can access affordable, healthy, safe, delicious food that suits our culture and identity. We walk or cycle or take the bus to work or to school because it is easier, it is safer, it is cheaper for us to do than it is to get in our car. We have clean air in our city because we're not driving polluting cars. We have jobs that play a living wage so that people don't have the additional stress and pressure of financial insecurity. You know, we have an environment in which people enjoy living in this city and lead lives that are healthy and happy and that health is part of having a happy fun life and a fulfilling life it's not a chore mm. you know, the answer to this is not a diet plan no one likes going on a diet plan yep i can well, verify that <laughs> what everyone said you know whatever any of the tv ads tell you um and that's why they don't work because actually you hate doing it and and you kind of praying for when can i give it up and go back to you know something i enjoy if we create a city in which these things are part of making our lives easier, making our lives more fun. And at the same time, they make us healthier. Then that's where we need to get to that. I mean, that ultimately, that is my job as director of public health. That's the kind of city I want to see. I want to see I want, Birmingham. Birmingham is amazing. I mean, I am, as you know, I've kind of moved to the city and become evangelical. I know. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. I, mean, I think everyone I know wants to get out of it, yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, it's like, this is England's second city. Yeah. You know, Birmingham needs to be bold and bright. This is not being like Manchester, brashy, all fur coat, no knickers, and like making loads of noise. This is about Birmingham being authentic, being bold and brave to go further faster be innovative you know the number of cultures we have in the city the number of amazing spaces i mean you know, i was talking to someone who lived in birmingham all of their life and i said you know we've got 531 parks in the city and they were like what yeah, i'm like yeah we've got 531 parks in the city we have more green space than paris this is a greener city than anywhere else in the uk per head of population yeah we actually have fewer fast food restaurants than manchester or liverpool uh yeah you wouldn't know it from the way it's kind of no. portrayed if you, if so, you go on certain roads though <laughs> yeah, well, it is, it is, to be fair they are yeah. in certain roads but yeah. If you look across the city, you know, per head of population, we're kind of middle of the pack of some of the bad stuff. Yeah. There are some things where we're like worse. Air pollution in the city, you know, the level of air pollution in the city is not just bad, it's dangerous. You know, that's why the clean air zone, that's why we've got a clean air strategy, you know, and, and I get it's really hard for people's lives. I mean, you know, I jump, uh, you know, I moved from a, a, a diesel car to a hybrid uh, electric petrol uh, car and it's not cheap and it, you have to save for it and make an effort but if we don't do some of this stuff we will not just kill ourselves we will kill our children mm. and that's the bit you know Birmingham is a city which is rooted in people who grew up here they live here they move here and they learn that this city has the most amazing restaurants it has art galleries it has ballet companies you know, we've got nine universities. Everyone goes, oh, we've got University of Birmingham. We've got all these little micro specialists. We have a theology university, a Birmingham University of Law. Um, you know, we make everything from artisan chocolate. These are the fake universities that used to, uh, you know. No, no, they're not the dodgy one. They're, they're legit ones. I checked yeah. them. I had to learn all this through COVID because suddenly <laughs> I was responsible for, for advising on them. But, you know, I, it's a bit like you kind of go, through COVID, I have learned even more about the city. You know, the yeah. fact that we have artisan chocolate made in Tisley, two streets away from a, a mattress manufacturer. Now, I only know that because I haven't had some cases there <laughs> during COVID. But <laughs> I think I think we learned that as well, didn't yeah. we? It was it's like you wouldn't. Tisley's not where I would kind of think. Oh yeah, that's where I'm going to go get artisan chocolate. Mm. You know, like really fancy stuff that's sold in Fortnum and Masons. Mm. But that's the joy of Birmingham, and and. One of the things I think we've got to be as a city much bolder about as we go forward is 
you know, this is a city of a thousand jewels, but not a single necklace in the place. It's not joined up enough. And that, you know, the 531 parks we've got are dotted around, but people can't see them. You know, we don't make enough noise and we don't do the wiring between the jewels that create a necklace that people go back and go, wow. Birmingham is a, is a fantastic city to live in. It, it's got lots of challenges, but it actually, you know, coming back to London for the weekend to visit my parents. And, you know, I was saying to friends we, we met up with yesterday, I was like, you know what? I won't go back to Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of this tube malarkey and <laughs> getting, taking, you know, an hour and a half to get across two miles of the city. Whereas in Birmingham, I can walk it. Yeah. And, and that we i think is that because you feel you know this is my kind of bugbear with the kind of like london bit is i can't i kind of work it around the like the elevator and the escalator um i can't even get my words out you know, you know it's a lack of sleep this is you know going going up the uh, the stairs you know mm-hmm. electric one yeah I'm escalator. really yeah that's i'm really murdering this um i think london you just run up and down them, and, and in Birmingham, we let the escalator do the work. <laughs> it's a much, it's a much kind of slower pace. I always felt that you can, you're able to kind of live here, and you you can make your time. And I, I feel the culture down in London, the time is really dictating your life. I, I don't know. I mean, I think you know we've got to be honest that here, um, it's getting Birmingham, it, it's getting faster. You know, I don't. I don't, you know, frankly, if I wanted to kind of go and have an easy life, I'd have gone for a job in Devon. Um, <laughs> you know, it's nothing wrong with Devon or Cornwall, but it's not, you know, the, the, there's a different pace. Um, and actually, there are lots of parts of the city where the pace is moving really, really fast. I mean, you only have to look at, was it one Cornwall Row, the new thing yeah. that's going up, you know. I mean, that's gone up in like a year. Um, you know, the, the rate of transformation of the city um is so fast and actually look at what's happening in digbeth i mean amazing i I haven't managed to get a table yet at the i think it's 860 grams the the new restaurant that i mean just looking at what's coming out of people's brains in in digbeth at the moment is just wow and so exciting that you know the mayor's plans to turn that viaduct into kind of a, a, a uh, an open air park the rewilding of the re river that runs from central mosque up round to the the old paragon hotel um which will bring back the river space and the wildlife around it as well as regenerating all of those empty dead warehouse spaces um you know this is a city which is moving and was moving before the pandemic and i i hope will continue to move i think what's also different though from London is that what we don't have quite as much of London's a really transient city and I spent 20 years living in in Peckham and in Bermondsey in southeast London um in London your neighbors change the whole time Mm. like people there are some people who stay but it's really mobile I think what there's more of a sense of Birmingham is that um people grow up here and they do stay either in Birmingham or in the West Midlands they stay connected And they keep coming back. They might go away for a bit and they come back for a bit. I mean, you know, um, and that, that's, that's something that's special about Birmingham. That drawback to, to Birmingham, um, is, is a different space and people have a sense of identity. And I, you know, it does come back to, is that difference of, you know, Birmingham doesn't shout itself from the, the rooftops. It's a much humbler space. And, um, you know, there are, well, I talk about Birmingham to friends and they're kind of going, oh, wow, you know, that, I didn't know that. I didn't know you've got Michelin star restaurants. Um, I didn't know you had all this green space. I didn't know you could buy an apartment that's bigger than the one in London for half the price, um, that you've got more canals than Venice and you can walk along them safely. And, you know, unlike Manchester, you don't get pushed in them all the time. Um, <laughs> I, love I haven't got bitch. a massive down on Manchester, <laughs> I should say that. But, it's, but I think it's one of those that, you know, if you ask people what was the second city of England, I don't think a lot of people would know it's Birmingham. And I think we've got an amazing city. We've got to be bolder about and braver about being proud about that. Um, and it's our city. 
you know it's it's too easy i mean what really you know and and you know i think where people uh, i think it does get annoying is we get people who kind of sit back and just grumble about everything and you go well come on get off your butt and help you know if you think our parks are a mess join a friends of park scheme you know there's money to help support get them set up there's loads of work going on in the parks make a difference you know Mm. it's our city it's not their city and and i think that's the bit of it's much you know london's i think where we've got the edge on london is birmingham is a city we are one city we're one council one city you know and whereas in london you've got 32 different councils if you live in southwark versus living in barnet you have completely different sense of identity and connection whereas in birmingham actually i think we all share this sense that we are part of one city and you might you know you might be someone from Sparkbrook or Aston or Sutton Mere Green or down in Longbridge and you might have a sense of that's your bit of Birmingham but it's your bit of Birmingham and it's the Birmingham that is the city we want to be bold and be proud of. So I just think this is called the bandwagon and I do this in every episode. So there's um, this is an opportunity of just in case that you have got something on your chest that you want to, you know, talk about, let's say Eurovision or anything else. Um, <laughs> uh, is there something that you want to, you know, get off your chest? Mm, well, I didn't get to see Eurovision last night because I was out of game, so I haven't seen it. I haven't seen the result yet. But oh. um... <laughs> I was really going to kill it for you just then. <laughs> um, I, I I know that the UK did really badly, um, and and yeah, that's a, again that's a whole other podcast. Um, I think the thing that I I kind of thinking what would I get on the bandwagon? What would I really have a go about? You know, what really gets me going at the moment is judgment. Um is the the lack of compassion particularly on social media and i know you had like jess uh, phillips on last week you mm-hmm. know i mean clack is classic example and whether you like jess's politics or not she's getting off her butt and trying to make a difference in the mm-hmm. world and the abuse that she takes the abuse that i've seen direct to the public health get the finger pointing the really nasty personal attacks and you just kind of go, wow, have you not got something better to do with your life mm. than spout hate? Um, and I think that we've got to change that balance. You know, I was, I was out with my sister today. Uh, my nephew is in year 12 and she was telling me how they, in the last week, they've corrected three children who used the term gay uh, as a term of, of abuse or, or disgust, basically, in, in the playground, in front of those kids' parents who weren't addressing it. And it's that kind of casual, oh, I can send a hateful Twitter tweet or I can send uh, an email to someone I've never met before because I can happen to work out what their email is and tell them that they should die and rot in hell and it's their fault, you know, that my life is miserable. Um, and I just I think as a society we we've, we've got to have a better conversation about one what what are we doing to teach our kids to be more compassionate of stuff I think going on at the moment where it is not okay um, and it's just not being called out um, it's not okay George Floyd was murdered it's not okay that over 400 trans people are killed through violence every year. It's not okay that 11 year old boys in a playground uh, call something gay because they think it's useless or out of fashion. Um, It's not okay that people who are carrying excess weight uh, are teased and ridiculed rather than supported with compassion. Um, You know, these things are not okay and we as a society have got to own that and we as individuals have got to own that and be a little bit more compassionate because otherwise we will just descend into yeah more hate yeah no i, I mean it, i mean the more i do uh, these podcasts and, and and you you have discussions you know i think the 
the vehicle of like social media just comes out mm. again and again and the language around it is something that I've become kind of more and more conscious and the more I kind of talk about it the more I kind of hate it it's getting it's getting to that point where I think it's just a necessary evil that we're gonna have to kind of live with however how we can change that in terms of like the language like you're saying might make it a bit more of a, a pleasant place yeah, but I mean, I think, you know, you only have to look at the whole Martin Bashir, Diana thing mm. 20 years ago. I mean, we live in a culture in which it's clickbait. It's not just about social media and the Twitter trolls. I mean, they're bad, but it's also about the fact that, you know, sensationalism sells. You know, we we buy into it because we click through, you know, there's horrendous barriers. I mean, the, the thing for me that kind of epitomized this is... You know, when you, you open the page and it's got that little banner at the bottom and it's like these childhood celebrities, see them now. Yeah, yeah, Susan yeah. Boyle, what does she look like but, today? Yeah. You know, it, it's those kind of things that you kind of, and people click on them. You click through. And when you click through, what you're doing is feeding the advertiser at the other end. So the website at the other end has some useless story. Normally with loads of pictures, you have to click through of yeah. this is what, you know, Macaulay Culkin looked like then. And this is what he looks like now. Um, but the ads on the side are generating income for that website. And the, the longer people stay on that website, the more money, the ads, the more money, the advertisers are paying that website to, to advertise. So there's a whole economy which is basically being generated around clickbait. And you, you talk to journalists now and, and good news doesn't sell. You yeah. know, uh, you look, just look at, I mean, I, I, I this sounds awfully pro but, you know, I used to love regional news because there was always like the puppy story, you know, so-and-so got their cat rescued, here's yeah. baby llamas. When did we last see a puppy story? No, right, hang on. I used to have this, I have this same argument about, say, there's surely better news to be reported than about ducks. So I've got a, I got a friend of the family who's actually a, a cameraman for the BBC. And I used to just tease him and say, like, look, I know about another five stories that you could report on, yet you're talking about reintegrating ducks to West mm -hmm. Bromwich Canal. And I'm like, nobody cares. But you're saying you want that okay. i'm saying i'm saying you know you can spend your life watching news which is full of i mean we know that we actually there's there is some evidence around this that children are becoming numb to violence because they see it the whole time on the news you right. know the, 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 yeah. all you see is the news full of hate and violence you know i mean i remember when i first came to birmingham and i i, I a local newspaper shall we say online newspaper i have that app and it used to like flash flash up on my phone continue these notifications you know 16 year old flashed on bus you know 22 year old in car accident killed at major roundabout and i kept opening them kind of going is it birmingham is it birmingham and it was like west bromwich i was like okay breathe uh, and you know just seeing it come through is this continual kind of stream of negativity and that's where we need the puppy pictures that's why we like the cat memes um because you know i mean in america they have this thing this series of books called chicken soup for the soul and it's like classic airport reading it's like in little short stories that mm. that just kind of are feel good they're like good things happen to people um, often in the worst of circumstances and you know the 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 ducks being reintroduced the newts coming i mean it's always really newts newts yeah. or english or, salamanders. Yeah, or a new species <laughs> of beaver yeah exactly <laughs> whatever it is you know there's always something coming back because um you know because let's be honest you know quite a lot of football is not very happy news for, for a lot of our local teams unfortunately um I'm, if you see my yeah. eyes going down it's like my phone <laughs> blowing up the, <laughs> yeah it, it's you know it's all of the so we need those kind of happy bits in this in because actually that that balances out a little bit and and you know i think one of the things that you we're never going to create a world in which everyone is is lovely you know um not everyone's going to be kind to britney but if we have the regular puppy stories they reconnect us with 
um, compassion. They reconnect us with what's important. And, you know, I think <clears throat> each of us, you know, it, it, I, I give to charity um, through a kind of monthly subscription like lots of people do. Um, and I support two charities. I support one which takes, makes uh, fancy dress costumes for wheelchairs for children, which I just love because technically it, it brings me so much joy to see this like eight or nine year old whose wheelchair has been turned into the dragon from How to Train a mm. Dragon or the Starship Enterprise. And you're just like, wow, the engineering is just cool. Mm. Um, but also for that kid who is in that wheelchair, who every year will have looked at a whole load of Clarine costumes that they can't have, or that, you know, no one sees Captain America sat in a wheelchair because that's not what Captain America does. The fact that you can turn their wheelchair into the jet, so Captain America can be flying the jet, mm -hmm. you know, that I just think... It, it, What's that charity called? So I'm trying to. I knew you were going to ask me that, and yeah. I, I'll look it up on the Let phone me, while I'm doing it. Yeah, I'll um, buy some time so you can. Because uh... it is a really important one, um, and um, the other one is the uh, Rainbow Railroad, uh, which is something again I feel really strongly about because Rainbow Ro Railroad is a charity which works with. Um, LGBT people in countries where uh, they face the, face the death penalty. And like the railroad in America in pre-Civil War uh, and during the Civil War, it smuggles them out of the country. So, and you know, having known people who've come on this journey from countries where they couldn't be themselves and um, who have experienced that hate um then i think and, and you just listen to the stories and you go wow I, that just how do you survive that how do you survive in a country in which you just can't be yourself and you can't be with the person you love and every day you're watching your back and you're uh worrying about it and i just think that those people deserve a better life they deserve a life to be able to be themselves and be free and if the you know 50 quid a month i can give helps as part of that to to smuggle them to get them out and help them rebuild their lives mm. um i think that's really important the wheelchair charity is magicwheelchair.org Magic. um uh yeah and if you just want a bit of joy in your life i mean just yeah and what they do, some of the stuff they do i'm just like wow my mind is blown i mean they you know whether it's turning it into disney princess carriages or one of them had some weird giant spider which i was like that kid's got a freaky imagination but <laughs> it's just brilliant and and that whatever you know you do the worthy stuff like the the rainbow railroad um but do the fun stuff as well. And and it comes back to, you know, the the what got me what has got me through the last year has been finding light, finding joy at different points. And you know, whether that's been cat memes, which I'm not a big fan of, or you know, pugs in stupid costumes, or kids having amazing wheelchair designs, or the stories of LGBT people who've been smuggled out of environments of danger and hate and rebuilt their lives and achieved in, in a, in a strong and more supportive environment. It doesn't matter. It, it, it's the joy. It, it's the bit that you have to keep coming back and anchoring yourself to because this year has been one of the darkest ones in my life and finding the light every day is what makes it possible to go to sleep and wake up the next day and that we need to be, all be a bit better at helping light some candles for other people in their lives now we're coming out of it this year has been very much about keep your own light alive as we move out of this it's about how do you light that light for other people and that's where it comes back to that compassion and our responsibility as being creatures on this earth to make it a better place for everyone else and to 
leave a legacy that is worth having for those that come after us well that was pretty deep there just so uh, <laughs> what we're gonna do is before i start crying is uh, uh i'll i'll just say you know a big thank you for um for joining us and giving us some really interesting insight in in terms of like not only kind of the the day job in terms of what covid is and 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 you know just uh a thank you from uh uh from your from your leadership in that way so um i think whenever there's a a, a really big significant one i think i know mm. i have to drag you back on here <laughs> and just to do that so uh, no just a real a real a real big thank you for joining us today pleasure thank you for having me cheers <laughs>